this. So we're going to be recording this because, of course, I want to allow others the opportunity to watch this third part in the series. I'm going right now. I just got it on gallery view. Folks are slowly filing in. Um, and boop, I don't want to do that. I'm just reading the messages and things. Um, when I get going, I am going to have my, my view spotlighted, right? And that means that everybody should only be seeing my spotlight, only see my video. And that's good news. Um, but I, everybody can still be heard. And when you speak, it won't switch to your video, which is great. People can still continue to watch me. I say this because um, silent demos are, are a little weird. So <laughs> if you've got a question, I am perfectly happy to have you. In fact, more than happy, I prefer it if you ask your questions and I can chat with you. And in real time, we can start to dig into the details, right, of what I'm doing. So I just, I wanted to say that now so that folks have, you know, some appropriate expectations for what I'd like to have happen and, and what will happen if you speak. I know in a lot of classes, mine included, in the past, I didn't know what I was doing and other people don't know about spotlighting. So people stay silent the whole time because they don't want to have themselves be recorded and to switch it away from the demonstrator. But that won't happen today, which is good. All right. It is 11.03, and I'm going to switch over to my view. So you guys will just see moi. And... <sighs> Because this is going to be painful here, trying to keep all this up to date. That's what the cloud is for. It's beautiful for this solution where you have multiple devices. I can so hear somebody telling us here, all every about stage clouds. Up here, get it organized by directory, so then you can just move it. You know, oh, Let's there was find a trip this wonderful person. So I'm just going to move where are you, person? Directory over here to the cloud. And then from there, then we do this. The cloud like... will feed all these other devices. Nope. But if, but uh, if my, but if my um, phone somebody... was able to book the pictures, I'm just going to leave the pictures on the phone and just delete care. out. As long as you have memory, then you're Let's okay. Let's see. I'm rolling around here. Maybe it's Sue. It was. <laughs> nice to meet you, Sue. That's what I get for saying I don't mind if you're not muted. <laughs> All right, all's well. Um, back to spotlight and this view. So I'm let's get saying. rolling. Uh, nope. Boop. I have muted him. So, so today, uh, what we're going to work on is uh, reference photos and um, choosing good reference photos, editing your reference photos if you are having problems, right? Maybe the reference photo isn't as stellar as we would like it to be. And then simplifying it. So we've been going over these five basic rules of composition, right? In the previous two pieces of this three-part series. And just to reiterate, in case you haven't seen them, and also repetition is the mother of learning, right? So we want to hunt for contrast. We want to zoom in and crop. We want to have a foreground, a middle ground, and a background, right? Or as another analogy for that, another metaphor is we want a stage with actors and settings, and a setting, right? And four, we <laughs> want to stack our shapes. So we, we're going to go over that too. Don't worry. People have asked a couple questions here and there about stacking your shapes. And then the fifth one is to simplify, simplify, simplify. And 
as I've said before, sometimes when we zoom in and crop, we actually um, simplify. When we zoom in and crop, things that are very busy when we're far away get, of course, closer and closer and bigger and bigger in our field of vision. And that is a good way to simplify. And, and of course, um, making a NOTAN is a very powerful tool for simplification. And NOTANs do, they're the first step in many, many other parts of what you can be doing in your painting. They can help you do things like um, guide your wet into wet process, as an example, as you simplify your shapes. Um, that's a big deal as well. So it, it's, it's a lot of planning and sort of the mental part before we dig into things that come later on. And that's what we're going to sort of broach today is this bridge between your reference photo and then the no tan is the bridge getting you over to the part where you can be prepared to start painting. So I have some reference photos. And what we're going to do is I am, we're actually going to use my phone and I'm going to dial in with my phone and to this meeting. And we are going to use the phone to, I'm going to share the screen. And the reason I like to share the screen of the phone is that it, um, the phone is really where we're all taking photos, broadly speaking. I'm sure somebody in here must have a camera and they're like an aficionado, so they're going to prove me wrong. But the vast majority of us are using our cameras to take our photos. And the truth is, most of you aren't using something like Photoshop to edit your photos. I'm sure some of you are, but a lot of us aren't. And so I want to do it on the phone because that's where a lot of us are also editing our phones. Now I have an iPhone, but it's not that much different than an Android phone. And, and we're going to edit. We're going to edit some photos. I'm going to, and we're going to show you, I'm going to show you some examples of photos that don't work. We're going to do that too, but we're going to edit some photos and crop them and zoom in and find the contrast. And then we're going to open up the Notanizer app. And we are going to be using the Notanizer app to get a kind of a preliminary Notan. And then you'll see when we go through this, how it can be a really powerful helper. We're gonna use the Notanizer app to actually paint out a Notan. That's what I'll be doing. So that's kind of the steps that we'll be going through. And well, let's dig in. I'm gonna join this meeting with my phone and no audio. I'm going to stay this host. Here I am. And just a moment while I prepare this part. Takes just a second. And here we go. Wonderful. So you guys should now be able to see my um, my phone. Is that correct for everybody else? Great. Yes. Thank you very much for responding. I'm not speaking into a void. <laughs> so let's go into the Photos app and take a peek at what we've got here. I have um, this photo of, I need to be a little brighter for myself, that shows a local scene in um, the San Francisco Bay Area. And we are, this is one of the ones that we're going to use to zoom in and crop. We also have some other lovely photos. For example, if I rotate this, there we go. Um, mute all. Sure, let me explore that. Somebody's being very helpful and I appreciate that. Well, the short answer is, I'm in a different window, so we're going to have to roll with it. Thank you very much for that suggestion. I will explore that knowledge. We have photos that seem interesting but have problems. This is one of them. We're going to explore this photo in the Notanizer app, and I'll show you why it has problems. I get a lot of photos that have issues from students, and right, I've been talking about that in a series. Now we have this lovely photo, and guess what? It also has a lot of problems. And we're going to be talking about it. There's the one that I think is in, can become a successful subject. This nice photo 
It is Notanizer, just as Eileen has spelt it. You guys can look it in the chat roll, and you can download it if you'd like to try and use it, or you can follow, to follow along, or you can use it later. The Notanizer app is free, and it's available on Android, and it's available on your iPhone. So you can even download it to use it on your PC. And then we have this cute little photo, which is another potential uh, a positive photo that can be used. So first of all, photos that have problems. This very nice photo of this stream up by the coast. The first problem in this very nice photo uh, is number one, which is I'm trying to hunt for contrast. And I'm having a difficult time <laughs> finding it. So this photo doesn't really have a high contrast area that we want to focus on. And it makes it really difficult to have an interesting point of interest. When we zoom in and crop, you have to think that the basic reason that we're zooming in and cropping is because we have something we want to zoom in on. So when I zoom in, if I'm hunting around thinking, what the heck is this painting going to be about? That's a problem. I need an area that calls to me that has high contrast. And this doesn't really have any of that. It's really full of a lot of middle values. So that if I can't zoom in, if I can't find contrast and I can't zoom in and crop, then this is a photo that is a very nice memory for me and not a particularly good reference photo. I would have to change all kinds of jazz in this to make it work. Then we have this guy. So this has all kinds of interesting color contrasts in the lower half. Of course, it's got this giant sky. So we think, OK, well, Steve, why don't you just zoom in and get rid of the sky, which is true. But this is also full of a lot of, val of, of middle values. There isn't a high contrast area. Maybe, maybe, maybe we think these buildings far away are high enough contrast, but it is not a very good photo for that. And later, when I put this into the Notonizer app, um, I can kind of, the proof will be in the pudding, right? I can drop this in there, and we're going to look at this and see how it's basically full only of middle values and doesn't really have a high contrast area that it has, val it has color contrast, but that's about it. So this is also a photo that if I got from a student, I would pass on this. I would suggest to them that it wasn't worth their time. This photo is another photo that I think it definitely has high contrast, right? We have this tree. This tree is very dark. And behind it, we have a sunlit field of mustard. This is from the Napa Valley. But the problem in this photo is that when I zoom in, I am having a difficult time finding my, my point of contrast. And I want that point of contrast to be in the midground, right? We have a stage. We have actors that go on the stage. And we have a background. Or we have a foreground, a middle ground, and a background. And in this example, what's happening is I would call it the stage. That's the tree, right? It's in the foreground. The stage is very weirdly competing with the actors, right? I don't, I need something here in the midground. If there was a barn or a house or people working in the field, that would be something that I could use as my focal point in the midground. They would be my actors on the stage. But we don't have that in this photo. So all we have is this high contrast tree, and it's in the foreground, and that is causing problems. Hypothetically, if I took a photo of this tree, I was there, and I wanted this tree to be the focal point, then I would have had to back up and create a foreground for the tree if I wanted to use the tree as my subject, just as an example. Now this photo doesn't have that, so we're at a loss. So this is a photo I would skip as well. Now we have two photos, I think, they're good examples of photos where we have high contrast, we can zoom in and crop, and we'll have a foreground, a middle ground, and a background, and they're gonna make more compelling reference photos. So 
Of course, I, I see this very high contrast dock and this little boathouse. And this is high contrast enough for me that we can use it. So let's, I'm going to, um, we're going to edit it. I'm going to crop it. And I have this giant sky. Oh my gosh, so many giant skies and giant foregrounds in student reference photos. It's a common problem. And I'm trying to get to the part where we, you know, we're, where we're focusing on what the subject is so that the, the subject now is clear that it's not about this endless dock or the spit of land that was on the left-hand side of the photo, right? All of this jazz. That's just stage setting, right? That tells me I'm in Venetia and we're by the bay or something like that. It's not really the subject. And I can get a lot of that information from the background that I have here. I Steven? have a four, yes, please go ahead. This is Sharon, and I, I was wondering if at this point you pay any attention to, have you made a decision as to the size of your canvas or the proportions? Like, are you cropping with that in mind? I am, that's a good question. Now, I, I'm, I'm sometimes a lazy painter, so I'm often cropping to paint um, a quarter sheet, which would be 11 inches by 15. Uh, but as an example, sometimes I want to paint. Uh, it's like it's a it's an eighth sheet, so it's a long. It's half of a quarter sheet. It's seven and a half by eleven, as an or fifteen by five and a half. That would be something like this. That could be an interesting subject. Uh, I still have a foreground, a middle ground, and a background. Right? I have this foreground, which is the mud flats. It's the stage that I put the dock and the little boathouse on, they're my actors. And I definitely have a little background in the back, right? This is the hills in the distance. So I could do that. I also sometimes like to paint squares. I'm sure you guys have seen me do this, right? And one of the interesting things that a square does is it really forces you to decide what is the subject. Like sometimes when we paint a rectangle like this, we get a little lazy about including all kinds of stuff in our composition that's not actually essential. They're like supporting cast members. <laughs> so they, these are all good. It's not bad. I like the little ducks. I like the dock. It's an interesting shape. It's complex, but it's not essential. So I would just say if I was going to crop this into a square, I would have to decide. Is this painting, just to say, about this dock and the ducks? Of course not. But uh, I have to decide that. And it helps sometimes um, the mental game. It helps make it more obvious to me what it is that is my real subject. And that can become really important. So that's a great question. And I do uh, crop according to what I'm going to paint. Yes. So I'm going to zoom back out a little bit. So I like this dock and I have a little mud flats now with the little rocks and things leading me in and I have a background. So this is um, good and I'm gonna save it. We're gonna use this photo now in the Notenizer app. I wanna show you another example and it is, an, I wanna go through the process again of cropping and trying to find a good composition in a photo. Then I have this little one from um, Carmel, right? Down by the coastline. And years ago, that was my daughter. And so she was so young then. And many phones, for a lot of technical reasons about their aperture and all that good stuff, take photos that have a very wide angle. And they don't view the scene the way we view the scene with our eyes. So we often get really big foregrounds or really big skies. And that's, this photo suffers from it too. So of course we, we need a stage, but we don't need a stage this big. And the problem is, is our actors are so far away, right? It's like we're in the nosebleeds. So we need to crop it. I'm gonna zip that up there. 
and we're going to crop. So, I, and we're going to zoom in. Now, I definitely have high enough contrast, right? I think the little girl is dark enough against the pale beach. And that's because um, this, there's a shadow, right? She has a shadow underneath here. So we're gonna zoom in, right? We can see here, she is dark against a light background. And so are a lot of the people. We bring her in and I am going to rotate. And I do think for this one, I would like it to be uh, a landscape orientation because I want to, um, I want to show the beach and the sense of expansiveness on the beach. And I want a little foreground, right? I like this water in the foreground. I think it's interesting. And, and, and the truth is in some magical world, maybe I would zoom in. We could zoom in like this. This is a cute little photo as well, right? What's the problem? It's not a problem, but um, we lack context. Right. So when we think about setting in this example, if you're like, oh, I just want the people and the umbrellas and that's good enough for me and I don't mind this setting, then it's fine. I like the setting in this example. I wanted to include the sense of the hills and the beach. And I feel like we're missing that when I zoom in too far. Now, some of that's the problem of this reference photo. Maybe in a perfect world, if I was a professional photographer, I would have walked to a different point. I might have gotten closer to my subject. I could have had the beach, be be the ocean be behind her a little bit more. And right, there's a lot of things you could do. But when we have a reference photo, we're stuck sometimes. We're like, well, here we are. We need to use what we've got. So I'm going to zoom in and we'll say like this. I want that little bit of the ocean in. And... I am going to save it. So once again, we, we have hunted for contrast. We zoomed in and cropped. I didn't need, while it was very nice to have those poofy clouds up above, they were not, in my opinion, essential to the story, right, was, for in terms of setting. So I cropped out things that I felt weren't necessary. And I have a foreground, a midground, and a background, right? The foreground, definitely, we have this stage that leads us in to her. And we have, of course, our actor and actors. There's a little supporting cast around her, these different people. And we then have, in the background, stage setting. And definitely, right? This is one of those nice plays you go to and you think, gosh, what an amazing um, technical skill they have there in making their stage setting. It's really nice, but it is, I don't want the stage setting to compete with my primary subject, right? Otherwise, I'm not really um, doing due justice to what I want to share, which is to stay on the beach with the little kids playing. So I have now two photos and I'm going to pop them into the Notonizer app. Now in the class that I'll be opening up here, Actually, this demo is leading into registration. It's, yes, the short answer is somebody asked, hey, the shapes on the beach are a little scattered. Um, the people on the beach are a little scattered. That's a good question. But what you're going to see is when I pop it into the Notonizer app and we build a Notan, a bunch of these shapes are going to connect and the people, like that little girl, you see how there's a, a stream of water underneath her that has a darker reflection. It's the hills up above are reflecting into that little section of water. That little, she's gonna connect to that little shape. So one of the interesting problems we have sometimes is that we see, I'm gonna call them objects. We see the objects from real life in the photo a house, a tree, a person. But when, um, but when I am painting and making my notan and simplifying, I'm trying to think of them as abstract shapes, right? So 
the shapes are important. And so that darker value of the little girl is going to connect to the water underneath her and it's going to bond together, right? So um, sometimes I like to have the shapes connect. Sometimes it's just the nature of the subject. Like I have seen and I own some beach scenes from other artists that I love. And, you know, that's part of the beach. So I, you got to kind of roll with it. But it's a good question. And you're going to see the results of that experience um, when we go to do the Notonizer app. Somebody else was asking in here about um, the th rule of thirds and the cropping. And the short answer is, yep, I totally use the rule of thirds. And I'm, of course, this little girl is the highlight in my photo. So I'm interested in getting them close to the rule of thirds. And we have this lovely thing, which is these fellows over on the right hand side that are also playing in this hand are close to the rule of thirds as well. Um, so I do use the rule of thirds. I do, I did not make it the one of the essential five basic rules um, because A, a lot of folks already know about the rule of thirds. B, if you're editing your photo, it shows you right there that you need to do the rule of thirds. And um, and the truth is, uh, I have a second set of compositional rules that are more sophisticated and um, are about spatial relationships and abstract elements. And the rule of thirds is in that one. So I don't consider it, oh my gosh, the most important thing. No, that's why it's not what I consider a basic rule, but it's a value. And I've seen lots of interesting photos that zoom in and crop and have a foreground, middle ground, background, and they have their primary subject. And it is not off in one of these quadrants. And it's a little bit centered or it's centered, but up above or something like that. And I thought, that's pretty good. As long as it's not dead center in the middle, I, it, you can have a lot of really interesting options. So I don't consider it absolutely essential. And, and I think somebody else asked a good question. Do I follow the aspect ratios? I don't. I don't follow the aspect ratios. Maybe I could. But, you know, when I go into doing the no-tan and painting, eh, man, you're always having such a hard time anyways. Um, everything's always changing and morphing. So I'm not trying to let the dictates of what is going on in there and in the phone make, you know, dictate what's happening to me in terms of what I'm doing for the art. So this is the Notonizer app. We used the Notonizer app in the class. This is gonna be a big focus of this version of the class. We're gonna be doing, using the Notonizer app the very first day and doing a lot of what I'm doing now together. That's a big, big part of the class. And I wanna jump us into that as soon as we possibly can. So this is what it looks like when you pop the photo in. Right? It has to decide what's the brightest values and what are the darkest values. And what you can see is it's a mess. Fortunately, they give us this little slider. And if I go to the left, it starts to adjust the values for us. And this is a very powerful and useful tool. I'm just trying to get to the part, and it's purely a matter of opinion, but I'm trying to get to the part where the boathouse appears, right? Because that's my primary subject. And this is a really helpful tool for students to, yep, and there we are, we're back at it. Let me see if I can figure this out, folks. I actually don't know how to mute everybody. So we're gonna have to live with reality. Um, so this for me is a really, helpful tool for beginners, for people who are new to NOTANs. It's really hard to see this simplification of values. A NOTAN only has black and only has white, no gray. So if I go here, it says B and W. So we can see this photo in um, black and white. And what we see is that it's actually got a lot of middle values. Almost nothing in here is white. I think that little duck is white. That's the one thing. So that's a problem when we go to make the no tan because it's kind of, you know, when it shows us 50 50, it's basically all black. All those middle values get smushed together. And we want to bring it over here. And the goal is to start to try and find contrast. 
the boathouse, the water against the hill, the docks against the water, the rocks against the water, the ducks against the water. But notice also here, I'm gonna zoom in. You can do this inside the Notonizer app. It's a really useful app. You can zoom in and look around. Notice also when I was talking about the difference between objects and shapes. So here, the reflections are the same shape as the dock. They're not separate shapes. They're all bonded together. They're all darker than what's around them. And I would paint them as a single shape. I would, they would all be connected, right? That's gonna be part of the charm of painting a scene like this. So when I find something like this, this is pretty good. And it's got problems still though. That's one of the things we're gonna do when we do that, we're gonna resolve when we do the NOTAM. And I'll show you. So this gets us part of the way there and it's really a helpful tool for students, for people who are learning how to do NOTAMs. Do I do this when I'm making a NOTAN? No, but I've been making NOTANs for years and years. If you haven't been making NOTANs for years and years, then this is what you should be doing. So I'm gonna save this to my uh, photo roll. And I'm going to introduce a second photo to this. And that's the little girl on the beach. So we have, here we have, the, we have the cropped version of the photo. And while it's better than the other version, it's still got problems. So we need to slide the dial over to the left. And what we start to see is that the little kids appear more, right? Just enough. If I go more and more and more and more and more, like, oh, there they are, right? Very strong and separated from the background, but I want that little stream. And remember how um, Robley was asking, well, they seem very separated from each other, but actually she's very connected to what's around her. That's part of what makes this more interesting. And if I zoom in, you gonna let me zoom in a little, little photo? There we go. Here we can see, not only is she, and what's fascinating is she, her, the object, she herself is not connected to the little stream, but her shadow is, right? And notice also how that little patch of darkness behind her helps us create the light on her back, right? So we're painting her negatively by painting the dark shape around her. So those little sections around can be of value. I mean, ha ha ha, they can be of use. So this, this is just an example of how I, I'm trying to get folks to think about shapes, like abstract shapes on your canvas and not just um, objects, a girl, a stream. And, and it is worth saying, like there's a version here like this. This is a photo that I, this is one of the compositions I zoomed in on earlier. And I said, boy, if you really want to make it about this little kid, zoom in, zoom in, zoom in until the little kid is clearly obvious. This would be a fine example of it being about the little kid. What's the problem for me? It's not a big problem, but you don't have any ocean and you don't have any sky. So we're sort of trapped. That sort of airy feeling of the setting does have some value. So I, there is some use to this this version of it. So I'm going to roll with this version for the time being. And who knows, maybe I'll do this version and then later on I'll think, Meh, I should have done the other one. And that's how we learn, right? That's how we iterate it. Maybe the iteration is that we try a different composition. Man, that's a very reasonable thing to try out. I am often zooming in when I iterate. I have okay. a quick question, Stephen. Please go ahead. Um, hi. In, in the, hi. It's probably getting a little bit picky, but it's just because I noticed it from the black and white. So yeah. right, right behind the little girl's head, it's almost like the, the darkness that's right behind her is, is a piece of her head. So would you move that so her head stands out and still yes, be so able to get, okay. Great question. So this is a wonderful question, right? She's saying, hey, this little section behind the head, it's like smushing into her head. Um, and on some level, it doesn't bother me a lot because I can read that she exists, right? Because I got this arm and the hat and all that good stuff. I could put a pail with her over there sticking out separate from her. And then you would really know it was a little kid. It can be like a little symbol to unlock what's going on. I'm not above a little fiction. 
But the other thing is we're going to take these um, notonizer uh, images, what it's spitting out for us and generating. And the truth is it, it also has limits when we're going through this process. It can only crush what's there. It can't think. It can't decide what's important. Maybe the fact that her hand is connected to the same shape as the shadow doesn't matter as much because we know as humans it's a hand. But maybe the hat is more important because it's the head. I just made up that story, but it's kind of true, right? And, and, and so we as humans decide, hey, we, we need to change this to do the job it needs to do. And that's part of what we're going to do in the NOTAN now. So what I do is, um, I don't remember if I saved it. So I'm saving it. And I'm going to go back to my photos. And doo -doo -doo, there they are. I saved it twice. So this is good. <clears throat> I am going to exit the phone. I'm going to stop my screen share. And I am going to spotlight myself again. There I am. And we are going to move into trying out some no tans. So, <laughs> hey, Ellen and Robley, are no tans a big part of from photo to final painting? Yes. Yes, they are. <laughs> They're the a hardest really big part. part. Yes. But the, but the core, the guts of it, really what helps you do everything else. So, and, um, and in this version of From Photo to Final Painting, we're going to introduce the, the Notonizer app and this process that we're going through today. That's day one. We're diving into that earlier in the process than we have before. And the goal is always to get you to mentally to get you to the space where you're going to start working on your own photos, right? We need to have more practice. So that's something that's going to be a, a change actually in this version. So I am prepping my paper and I'm going to switch over to a different view. So just a second. Doo -doo -doo. Nope, not that view. How about this view? There we go. And I am going to uh, now we can find out how do we mute everybody. Here we go, mute all. Yes. All right, except for myself. But I'm happy to have you be unmuted or to put your questions into chat because I honestly meant really what I did say, which is it's nice to talk to people when I'm when I'm doing my demo. So these are the notans. I'm going to bring them over here into a spot where you guys can see it, and. Uh, Let's see if we can get that. Yeah, that's about as good as it gets. They don't. Oh, fully. Stop that. Go back. Swipe you, go away. There we go. So, and I need to make it dimmer. There we go. Now you guys should be able to see the rudiments of this no tan. And right, it's not it's not anything fancy. It's just what we were looking at a moment ago. What I really want to do is paint a notan. So why do we go through the process of painting the notan when we just popped it through the notanizer? Well, one of the reasons is the good question that was asked a moment ago. Well, what happens when we want to change something? The other reason we pop it into the note and um, we paint it. There's a couple of reasons. One of the reasons is that making a notan has a lot to do with drawing and sketching. And my experience is that people who end up making the notan become very well acquainted with their subject. And it's the same for me. I mean, I've been painting for years and years and years, and I get doing the notan. And if you've seen me ever do a notan, you think it keeps growing and morphing and all oh, that. That ratio was incorrect. And look, that, that goes all the way over to this point in the painting, whatever, right? That kind of stuff. And so I become well acquainted with the subject. And there's nothing like muscle memory to get you to that point. So I think it's important to, to do that, to do the note tan. 
And the other reason, of course, is it, it helps you find problems that you have to resolve, and you resolve them now, not later. All right. So here we have our very simple NOTAN. And I'm going to do uh, the NOTAN doing two different tools. So experience has taught me that if you're going to do your NOTANs, you need to find a tool that does it really in real black. So here I have India Inc. And I've just learned that you really should do it with ink. That's the short of it. You can either do it with India Ink and a little brush. Works great. And India Ink is something you can find everywhere, right? I could buy it at craft store or an art store, or it doesn't matter what country I'm in or anything. So India ink works really well. And yes, you know, I wouldn't dip my brush 100% into it. And yes, I need to rinse off my brush in the water. I have the water up here off screen. So, you know, those are definitely elements of what it means to use India ink. But a no tan is all black and all white. And I find if you are using tools that don't, that aren't all black, it really gets in the way of starting to have you think about them as shapes and not objects, right? We want to connect them all and bond them all together. So black works great, just a short of it. And I've had people do it with Sharpies and, um, and pastels and all kinds of things. And, you know, if you got to do what you got to do, then do it. But my advice is for 10 bucks, get a bottle of India ink or buy a little Pentel brush pen. So the Pentel brush pens are also about 10 bucks. You can get them on Amazon, P-E-N-T-E-L, and they have a little cartridge. You buy little sets of cartridges and you pop them in and you can paint and you can take it with you in the field as an example, or if you're traveling, I use this when I travel. And um, it has a really fine point and it's also ink, works great. So I'll be using these tools interchangeably, but my advice is get one of these two tools. And if you take the class, yes, that is now my strong recommendation. I've learned that lesson. It just makes what is already mentally a complex process harder than it needs to be. All right. So let's start with this little guy. Now, here it is as a photo, right? And I know the water isn't white, but we're looking for contrast and we're looking for ways to connect and organize our shapes. So I just want to sort of remember what this looked like because there are little things in this that aren't in the note can. Well, for number one, these hills go all the way across the background, <laughs> right? And they're sort of missing from the notan. So that's something. And then here's those dark ripples I was talking about. And here's the mud flats and the little ducks and jazz. And then also note in here, see how the roof line comes down? The shadow, the cast shadow, and then it goes across. And we actually have a little gap. And that's nice. It helps us understand the values of that area and the shape of the building. And, but notice how in here there's little windows and stuff. And I understand that the value of the little interior window is dark and the little value around it is light. But if I zoom far, far away, it all kind of smushes into a single value. Those are not significantly different shapes that are super important. So that's part of making the note in is to crush the values. So I have a little small iPhone here. And one of the things I'm going to have, us, I'm going to do is we're going to paint a really, not a very big note in. Maybe this is two by three, something like that. So uh, just to, I understand, I do big note hands sometimes and I share them sometimes. And they're super fun and they're super educational for me. There's lots of 
problems to solve in a subject. And when you paint bigger, you can solve smaller and smaller problems. That makes sense. How am I going to make a grass separator or whatever? But I've also learned that when we are um, a student and we're learning the process and we want to use it for composition purposes, smaller is better. So I'm doing this one small. That's my recommendation. Now, I understand you don't have the photo and you don't have the no tan right now. And that might make it difficult to follow along. But when I make a blog post about this, um, I'll share those reference photos in the blog post. And then you guys can participate if you want to do them then. So here's the no tan. And the no tan, first of all, I'm going to do is take off my quadrants. It helps me identify where things are appearing. So I have here my boop, stock. So, and this will take me five, 10 minutes, right? It's not going to be the Mona Lisa. It's just helping me see how the shapes connect. comes across and I already made it too big. <laughs> and that's how we learn, right? I was talking about this process of learning about the subject. You get lost in the details and things tend to grow. And that's how we, we learn it now. So I'm not fixing it later. So in goes this, I see, I'm looking here. That's like a quarter, that's like half. This starts over here and then it's like, so it's, let's just say it's gonna have to come over. Now I know there are problems in here, but we're gonna use my gouache and we're gonna solve some of the little exploratory problems that appear when we do no tans. And that's okay that they have occurred. It's part of the exploration of making a no-tan. I'm definitely not thinking of this as a finished subject. I'm thinking of it as a learning tool for me to get acquainted. It's like dating for art making. Here it is coming along. And then underneath this, there is actually a cast shadow from the boathouse. So the pylons come down, and some of them are crisscross, and it goes out past the shadow. And that is an interesting detail. And oftentimes these kinds of details um, seem happen chance, happenstance when we're painting them, but they communicate a lot about the reality of the scene that we're depicting. So it can become important. And if you don't, if you didn't include that, uh, an observant person would, would recognize something wasn't quite right. Maybe they couldn't put their finger on it, but there was no shadow underneath where this giant, you know, structure was. Okay. And here also, we have a little cast shadow. And this is the ripples. And I'm going down a little bit and zoom in. Whoop. Kind of see what I'm talking about. There's little reflections from the pylons. And there's little ducks. These ducks are not the actors. So they're, they're just staged, they're just part of the stage, they're just stage setting, right? I don't want to pretend like they're more important than they are because I don't want them to compete with too much. So obviously this big <laughs> slack down the middle, it's going to have to get fixed. That's okay. That's part of the exploration process. Now, I did think about what photo I was doing before I started. 
but I also, I like to let people experience what it's like to do a NOTAN. And so I'm exploring this with you a little bit on purpose. I think sometimes when you paint something too many times or you're too rehearsed, there's, it's not reflective of reality. It just becomes a performance. And I think for teaching purposes, it needs to not be a performance. We need to go through the creative process together. Okay. This comes across something like this. I'm going to go back to the color photo and I want to look at it for briefly. So do you see how this actually comes down and it's a separate value on top of the water? So I'm going to accentuate these reflections a little bit to help it communicate that the boathouse is there. And I see little ripples. And I see a little cast shadow underneath this. So these sorts of things are what the Notanizer app misses. And it's part of what we include in the painting process. Folks who have taken a class with me before, they know about this idea, I call it contextual contrast, right? Or local contrast. And what it means is that the Notanizer app, right? It has an algorithm and it takes the values and squishes them down and says, this is light, this is dark. And when I start to slide that little slider one way, it decides, oh, well, that detail, it doesn't decide what's important or not important. It only decides the value of that section. So that means we have to decide the importance of objects that go in. And part of how we hunt through here is we're looking for what I call local or contextual contrast. So as an example, these shadows underneath the docks are not as dark as the docks, obviously. And they're not, right? They're obviously the Notanizer app recognized, hey, that's a middle value. It's really similar to the value of the water. But we know, hey, that little shadow is important. And these little ripples on the water from the, from the pylons reflections, those could be important if I want to communicate this story, right? And if I was a master Sumi painter, I might want to include those little details to help me make sense of this scene and tell the story of this scene. So this is the part that really requires practice, and it really requires that you train your brain. And that's why we do it so much in the class. We do it all day the first day, and you're going to have assignments over the first couple of weeks where we're practicing it. And then the goal is to get you to the point where you're doing this for your own subjects later and you actually know what you're doing, right? That's the goal always is that this always needs to eventually be applying to you and your work. So we've got this, all this jazz in the foreground. And the next thing to recognize is that we have a background and it is, it's these hills. So the hills that are closer to us are darker. They are experiencing less atmospheric perspective. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring in the horizon line first to guide me. And I'm going to bring it across here above the pylons, right? And we're going to cut our edge here. Basically, I need to make sure I keep that little sense of a horizon and I can't lose it. I don't want to accidentally paint too far down and basically swallow up my pylons. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut the edge so that I'm being safe when I start to paint in the hill. The other thing is that this little roof comes out. I'm zoomed in here, right? The little roof comes out. It goes over. It goes across to the roof line. And then I'm gonna keep a little sliver of white to help communicate the, the other edge of the roof. Then I zoom back out. Now we can paint the hills. Ooh, let's get this onto the, the view. There we go. So hills go in. 
Notice how in this, the hills are about twice as tall as the roof. Something like this. The roof has to appear. So I need some darkness around the roof. But it doesn't have to be everywhere around the roof, just most of it. There we go. So now we have our new, <laughs> now we have the new shape. I was just doing not these, but different notans yesterday, um, uh, Sunday, and I was making um, videos for the class. And I went through the same process. I drew a box and then I was like, oh, wait a minute. That, that is not correct. But that's why we do the notan. It helps teach us helps us teach ourselves. And then this slowly is tumbling down to the horizon line. Now, notice how I don't have to have every little section of the mountain separate from the sky. It's okay to have, um, it's okay to have areas that have a similar value where we allow the sky and the mountain to sort of wash one value or one color into another, right? We don't have to, it's like, it's like when you go and see in a movie and we say, boy, that was sure on the nose. It told you everything that you were supposed to know. I wish they just trusted me that I was intelligent enough to figure it out a tiny bit on my own, right? It works that way for art too. So it's useful and interesting when we don't communicate every single tiny detail we simplify it and we allow little escape hatches little ways to move from one area to another so it moves on down here and now we have a, the final problem for this subject before i move into the white to start correcting things which is where do the hills go so the hills go behind this dock and we have our first real problem so i'm just going to let it dissolve here i'm going to cut an edge on that figure and i'm going to cut an edge here and so this is communicating to me that we have a problem in this subject that has to get resolved if we want it to read easily and that is that these are similar values. So something's going to have to get fixed there when we go to paint it. That's okay. That's what we do the notan for, is to find out these problems. So I rinse off my brush. It's almost noon, but I think we'll have time to do one more little notan because the next notan has even less shapes. But what I want to do first is I want to drop in the gouache. Somebody was asking about the brush pen. The short answer is no, it's not as waterproof as you're going to want it to be. They were asking if it's waterproof, this little guy here. It's not. If you do some sort of research, you'll find out that you can use certain different ink cartridges in it. And there are some ink cartridges that are waterproof. So it can be done with ingenuity, but it, the, the short answer is no. <laughs> That's the short answer. So I'm looking here at my no tan and and I'm and I'm just assessing little details, right? There's here's like a little patch of uh must have been grass in the far section. And of course I had this mistake with the shapes, so I'm erasing my little lines. Um I, I've had people try um Thank you very much, Dorothy, for your help. I appreciate it. Um, I've used other kinds of white, and I do find a thick, gooey gouache has been the best. I do it straight from the tube. People have asked also about like permanent markers and things. Of course, you can try a permanent marker. The real question is, is your permanent marker really black? That's an important question. And, um, and, the, and I also, so sure, it's a short answer. You got to do what you got to do. I like also working with a brush 
because that's what painting is. And so I'm getting practice painting while I do my no tans. Painting opaquely is something to practice. People have a hard time painting opaquely, particularly if you've been doing washes and you know, you're painting with watercolors. So learning to paint thick can be of use. It's part of what you can get out of a no tan. So that's a thought too. So I like to use a brush partly because I think it's a, it fills me with joy and I, but also because it's good practice. Here I'm erasing those little funny bits that I didn't like, right? They were my little mistakes. And now I'm looking at my no tan and I'm just assessing, are there any areas where I feel like I should have little somethings in here that might be kind of important? And it isn't always the case. Look over here. There's like a little section in here where I can see through and it's combined. I'm stacking my shapes. Boy, I forgot about stacking my shapes. What are you going to do? Nobody's perfect. I'm stacking my shapes. I didn't talk about it as an important compositional element, but well, there you go. Nobody's perfect. Least of all me. Stacking your shapes lets us move through the subject. So in this example, the fact that the boathouse and the docks connect to the background is important. If they're not connected, you have these you have really fat, strong shapes that um, don't let us move through the painting very quick, easily. And it can become really boring because we're not having any connections between the shapes. So I wanna stack my shapes. This allows me to stack my shapes. And I see that there's little bits of white in here. It's because these are actually little rocks and things over here on the bottom right. And I think that'll be almost everything for this. I'm gonna draw in my upper uh, edge using my little Pentel brush. And then, you know, that one is, that's done. And, and we've gone from picking the reference photo, zooming in and cropping, right? Hunting for contrast. They have a foreground, a middle ground, and a background, and they stack their shapes, meaning the middle ground, for example, connects to the background. That's important. So I want to try one more. It's 12 o'clock, and I think I have just enough time. I do have a 12.30 appointment that I'm going to be going to today because we're in the middle of our day. But I think, whoop, I want to make sure everybody's doing all righty. Yeah. So I want to do another one, right? We had this one about the beach. Here we are. So let's do this one with the Pentel brush pen, just so you guys can get a sense of what it looks like. I'll put away the India ink. Stephen, so, I have a question about the first one you did. Sure, please go ahead. The foreground, the rocks or the muddy part. Yep. Does that need to connect somehow when you paint that into a painting, will you actually pull a lighter, a mid-value line between that to the shadows of the, the dock somehow so that they actually kind of touch? Yes, if I can, the short answer is yes. It doesn't always work that way. I went back here to the original reference photo, right? This is where you have a reference photo and you have your no tan side by side and they can give you a complete picture of what's going on. Here, they actually feel a little bit separated. Yeah. But if I go back, they're pretty connected. So mm -hmm. for example, um, right, our eye experiences those that range of values better. And it recognizes, hey, this is kind of important stuff over here. So I might connect them like this if I can, mm -hmm. right? Okay. So a little, if I can, and if I can, Short answer is sure, yes, right? The long answer is it depends on the subject and art making is a little journey and we find out when we make it, whether it was, whether it worked. And I definitely am not um, pedantic about feeling like you got to do it this way because the truth is, I, right? People do all kinds of things that break all kinds of rules. And then you think, well, that looked awesome. <laughs> I wish I had thought of that. So, you know, it's all, they're all, they're all ideas. 
and then you apply them. But I know the goal when you're, when you're learning is to try to follow the rule because you're a bit lost. So the short answer is if I can, yes. I'd like to attach it somewhere. Okay, but I don't thank have you. To. Yep, Thanks. good question. All right, let's jump into one more. That's this little simple one here. And yeah, this needs to be zoomed in. I think I was wrong. I just think you can't see enough. So I'm going to listen to myself. We're going to zoom in. Uh, this Pentel brush pen needs to have a new cartridge. You can, I don't know if you can tell, it's a little, I have this lovely dry brushwork, but it's not going to do the job for this little demo. They were great. I love them. I talk about them on the blog. I recommend them to students. They're cheap. You can get cartridges. So you're not throwing away a new element every time. There's a lot to love about them. It so seems like they would be, oops, sorry. No, please go ahead. I was just going to say, it seems like if you're painting plain air, they might be easier than trying to carry the ink. As 100%. Well. You know, real, real studly plein air painters who are ink aficionados, they take the ink with them. <laughs> That's too much for me. I can't do it. Um, and, and if you travel, then, you know, you, it's the same problem. You get, you gotta, you can't take it with you. So no, I take the ink. I take the Pentel brush pen, which has never leaked on an airplane for me. And I put it in a Ziploc bag. I would never, I'm not that brave. Um, so up here, I, I have my dots and dashes, right? I'm composing this as we go, but you can see this idea. It's past halfway. And there are little like umbrellas and stuff far away. Now this is, it gets all digitized, but that's fine. This is just meant to be real simple. I don't wanna overstate the value, the importance of what's in the background. I wanna simplify it. So what I'm doing is I'm cutting my little edges. I'm creating the tops of umbrellas and you know people's heads, whatever it might be. And I'm painting in this little area. There are little bits and pieces up here on the hillside. You can see them in the photo. They're dots. So it's been very simplified for me. That's okay. I'm gonna leave some little dots and dashes and things, which I would normally wanna leave anyways if I was painting. I don't want it to be like a brick on top of my, my painting, right? I want it to have a variety of value variety of shapes in it goes something like this right Boop. you can see these were over here i've kind of moved them into the subject a little bit and i am going to bring these down i'm just creating my horizon line and my little walking people These ones here are a little closer, folks, over on the right-hand side. It's like we've got a couple, right? There are a couple. I can tell there are a couple because I understand what humans look like, but they're one shape, right? That's, that's love for you. They've become one shape. So <laughs> they're not separated. And they're actually connected to the land here, right? We have little shadow lines and things that they're connected to. And here I can see oh, little feet and little things in the distance. Then let's get these folks in here in the, in the foreground, right in the midground. So the foreground is just this something, something. We know it's the beach. So it's white in this example where I've zoomed in, but we know it's the beach. So we come in, whoop. She's going to have a back. She has a little hat. Thank you, Sugar Plum, for this memory. She comes down. That's her shadow. That's her there. She has little legs that kick out. And you really don't need much to communicate that a human exists in a spot. 
then behind her so behind her is this little bit of darkness right and it's going to help us communicate her back um let's get that in there i'm going to cut my edge Now, little details like this edge that I'm cutting and the fact that it um, is helping me create this um, light on her back, that little kind of stuff can be really important later when we're painting the subject, wet into wet and simplifying our shape. So that's definitely a key piece of the magic that a no tan can be. Now I can see here, I have once again, overestimated how much space I have, and I have to, uh, we're going to expand the painting. That's fine. This is how I learn what's going on, right? So she has this river that she's connected to. Now the subject, if I'm going to give her a foreground, this painting has to become bigger, <laughs> right? This is how we learn as we go. This comes across. That's okay. So I'm learning as I go the details of this little subject. And the truth is, is that if you were doing this, you would also be learning as you went. That's the nature of making a note in. That's kind of the discovery process. So let's put in another couple over here because I have two of them now. And we're going to make them a little closer. So I'm just moving the subjects over a little bit. Now we have these little kids here. They're just about where the uh, seam of this cruddy, cruddy dirt that I drew on this is, this little leftovers from the end. Give you a head. There we go. That's okay. We know what's going on there. A little heel kicks up, something like that. And in this little beach scene, that's about as far as it goes. It's a real simple little scene. But, uh, you know, beach scenes often are simple little scenes that's part of their charm so i clean off my brush i grab my gouache and dry my brush off you want to have your brush be wet but what they call thirsty it just means it's damp right we want it to be able to sort of bond to the gouache that's in here and but if you have too, too much water on your brush you can't paint opaquely because it's diluting it. So we need, ah, see this is still wet. So it's making it turn into gray. Gotta dodge that little kid. But we want it to be opaque. And that means it needs to be thick. So we don't wanna dilute it. And I can see, I can get this little arm to appear. It'll help make the little figure appear a tiny bit. Little daubs and dashes. And I can see, I wanna, I get, there we go. Clean that one up. And, and I'm gonna say, that's pretty good. That's close to what I want it to look like. And I can do little things like these two knees connect, they come down. But now I'm just being nerdy. I I'm just excited about the subject. And so I'm starting to just try and pay attention to what I'm doing and 
but the gist of the subject is already done. It's hard to leave it alone. Okay, we'll leave it alone. No, I want to play with it. So I'm going to close this before I accidentally spill it. And I'm going to close my gouache. Um, and I'm going to switch the view up to the top. So I'm going to share tomorrow the blog post. And the blog post will have um, photos of these little notans, and it'll have the reference photos available for you guys to take a peek at. And so you can paint along if you haven't been able to paint along today. Maybe this reference photo content wasn't um, of high enough resolution. That's fine. Um, so that'll be available, as will the recording of today. That's also going to be available. But what I want to do is change the view so I can just be me talking for a moment before we go. So the first, I didn't know if you guys have a question or two. I have a few more minutes left before I was going to head out. And then I want to um, introduce the opening for the registration for the class and ask any questions that you might have about the class. OK, I'm going to say that means no questions for the moment, since nobody has spoken up. Um, and I don't see anything new in the chat. Okay. So uh, if you are on the wait list and you are looking to um, enroll in from photo to final painting, the enrollment is open now. You'll have an email in your inbox with the news about enrollment. The you're welcome, Sharon. Thank you very much for saying thank you. The um, um oh please go I, ahead. I, thank you. Um it's Elle from um New Zealand. Um uh, okay. I'm wondering, um where you would take these now, sort of. I mean, I, I know you're running a course, but just just sort of an overview of, of what your next steps on these would be. Yes, for sure. Um so the next step. After you've completed your notans, the thing to recognize about notans is they help you simplify your shapes. And that's also what wet into wet painting does, right? We're often to connect, that's the inherent nature of wet into wet painting, it's connecting your edges. So when we would go to paint, which is the next step, I would be using the notan to help me decide what do I paint first? What are my palest values that are going to be my first wash? And what are going to be my darker values that are going to go on top that are going to get connected together wet into wet, which would be the black values. So that's really how we start to apply the notan and, in, and use it in our painting process. It's really, it can be a powerful tool for guiding us about how we want to paint our washes and how we want to, what order we want to paint our washes, like what shapes are going to go in and how we want to connect our wet into wet shapes to try and simplify what we're painting as well as we can. Does that help you, El? Yes, it does very much. Um, Perfect. I was just wondering about, do you do like value charts of, of your, um, your colors for this? Um, I don't is the short answer. Um, in the class, we talk a lot about color and the idea that color has value. So the value of your colors is important for sure, because that's going to be part of how you interpret what is white in your notan, right? What's going to be your first wash? How are you going to apply your pale values? Well, your pale values are often going to be right certain colors. And, uh, and what's going to be your darker values. So I don't do a color value chart. I don't, it's a short answer. But uh, understanding the nature that, that color has value is really important. And that is a, that's, so that's important. Yes. And that's relevant to the notan because the darker values for your darker color mixtures are, are of course, are going to be your, your blacks from your notan. Thank you so much. Yep. Is your class starting soon, Stephen? It is. So okay. 
the way the class is functioning is that um, we will be meeting every other Saturday morning for uh, 12 weeks. So it's seven meetings. The first meeting will be this coming Saturday morning. And then we'll meet every other week for three hours. We'll meet, that'll be live sessions. So the goal of this new format that I'm doing is that I had a lot of people speaking to me about wanting um, to participate, but it was simply difficult to do a whole day of class. So the new version allows you to come in for the morning if you're on the Pacific coast or a piece of your afternoon if you're on the East coast. And if you're in Europe, it'll be an early evening time, right? Nine o'clock in the morning is I believe five o'clock or six o'clock in the evening in England. So you can, it's just an evening course. You could do it if you're in Paris or Italy and it would just be over by about nine o'clock. So it's a three hour course every other week. And then we'll have a, um, a midweek subject for you to paint. I'll be giving you that every week, something that there'll be self-study. And then I'll have these things, I'm calling them Chilling with Steve. So it's a Q&A session that'll be every week live. And that'll go for an hour and that'll be midweek. So the idea is we're gonna have class every Saturday, every other Saturday morning. That'll be new content, doing demonstrations, painting along with me, working on stuff. And then in the, you're gonna get the opportunity to have a functional, like an applied skill-based self-study painting you're gonna do on your own after that. Then you can talk with me midweek. I'll be available for the hour long meeting. You can give me questions if you can't make it and I'll answer them and record it. And then I'll also have sort of what I call video on demand content. So it's content that uh, I release to you. You can watch it on your own time schedule when you want to. And this will be pre-recorded content that is like PowerPoint presentations and other content like that so that you can get the theoretical content down ahead of time. That way, when we go in to do the live session, we get a full three hours just applying things, answering your questions because you already have watched the videos, that kind of stuff. And then we'll be moving through uh, wet into wet painting. Um, we'll be going through color and the watercolor clock. We're gonna do um, you know, lots of stuff on color has value and mixing, mixing your colors and controlling your color mixes. Previous students, this will be, right? This will be, a, this is going back to the core elements, those pieces of the pie. And then we're gonna move into painting your own subjects um, earlier than we did last time. So also that'll be something new. We get into your reference photos and having you have a couple of different weeks long when you can start working on your own reference photos, meeting me for the Chilling with Steve hour when you can get your own input. And then also having a lab where we're gonna go into the deeper elements of composition later in the course, some abstract work, stuff like that. And that'll be when you are at the phase when you are working on your own photos and moving into what you're gonna do for those. So that's kind of a broad overview of the class and the new formatting for the class and the content and how we're improving it and making it stronger. And the uh, never meeting every other Saturday. And the first meeting will be this coming Saturday, 9 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. So if if you're ready, um, you can head, you can check your email box and you'll find in there the email to go check out the registration page. And we do things now, like also you can divide payment over multiple months. That's something else that we're doing now for this longer version course. So you can break it up into smaller payments. That's something else I'm interested in offering folks. It was one of the requests and I thought it made sense for a 12 week course. So yeah, I'm very excited to offer. We've been working on background for months, about two months now. And so it's nice to have this. Give the part where I'm done preparing and, uh, and get back to teaching and painting and um, really connecting with the students. So did anybody else have a, a final question before I signed off? I have another, I have to go to a meeting in about five minutes. So I need to go, but I just wanted to check in with you. 
I have a, <clears throat> a comment. I would just like sure. to say, having taken the first from photo to fi final painting, it was a fantastic course and I encourage anybody to do it. And I spend at least one or two hours every single day going over your recordings and painting everything and iterating. That's oh, wonderful to hear. Thank you, Ellen, for speaking out. I'm glad to hear that that is, you know, that it's still good for you, still useful for you, and you're using those recordings. That's very, yeah. What I like to hear, right? I put a lot of effort into that version too. <laughs> so that's lovely. Great, you guys. Well, thanks for coming. We had uh, Thank just you, under 50 people. Oh, yes. Thank you. <laughs> oh, you're welcome, Susan. My pleasure. Thank you. Yes. You guys have a good day. And, um, I'll see you at the blog post with all of the content tomorrow. Bye, Jackie. Nice to see you too. Bye, you guys.